So benchmarks for Apple's new M1 Pro and M1 Max chips have started appearing on Geekbench 5 already, and all the tech outlets seem to be discussing them. Now, I'd have liked to have waited to test it for myself, but since we're living in a world of instant gratification and the results look genuine to me, let's talk about what they mean. Uh, and maybe we can correct some misunderstandings and unrealistic expectations along the way. I expect these results are coming from tech media outlets who've received pre-release machines to review. Uh, and there are quite a few results, as you can see, and they're all very similar. And the results are in line with what I expected to see. So I think that we can trust that they're correct. Uh, so let's start by taking a look at CPU performance. Now remember that with the exception of that entry level M1 Pro, all of the chips have got the same 10 core CPU. Uh, that's eight performance cores and two low power efficiency cores. The Max chip has double the total memory bandwidth, so we should expect to see slightly higher scores, but overall, I'd expect them to be fairly similar. Single core performance looks to be scoring around 1,780, and that is slightly higher than the standard M1, and that's probably due to the increased memory speed. This is exactly what we should expect. These new chips are still M1 chips, using the same core designs, running at the same clock frequency. Multi-core performance though is showing around about the 12,700 mark. Uh, some people are surprised by this, others are thinking that it's exactly what was expected. And it is in the ballpark of what I was expecting for a Geekbench 5 result. I expect that in real world usage, the margin over the standard M1 might be a little less. But to explain that, we need to talk about multi-threaded performance and benchmarks. Multi-core CPUs offer their benefits in two ways. Uh, firstly, it allows app designers to design their software so that multiple jobs or threads can be run in parallel, and that speeds things up. Uh, secondly, it allows the operating system to multitask more efficiently. Uh, so let's just focus on that first benefit. What you need to understand is that not all apps have need of a large number of concurrent threads, and it is largely down to the developer to code their app to make use of the additional cores. Now, some apps really do lend themselves to this, Let's take, for example, music production software. We've got lots of channels running software instruments and effects. This is ideal for large numbers of threads, and that's why music professionals choose processors with lots of cores to allow for large instrumental scores to play back in real time. Uh, but for many apps, it doesn't make sense for the developer to split tasks into multiple threads because often the performance benefit wouldn't make that additional coding effort worthwhile. So once you get above four or six processor cores, you start to see diminishing returns in real world tasks, unless you're running specific software that can benefit from those additional cores. Benchmark software like Geekbench 5 is designed to test all the cores. So the results that we see won't always translate to the real world. If you take the standard M1 chip, it offers more than enough CPU performance for the vast majority of people. And a lot of people buying these new chips just won't see that additional performance. But of course, these chips aren't just about CPU horsepower, uh, but I'll come back to that. Now, there are some who are wondering why we aren't seeing a bigger uplift in performance. After all, we've got double the number of performance cores compared to M1. But CPU performance doesn't scale in such a linear fashion, especially as core counts start to increase. Uh, something else to remember is that efficiency cores are playing a part here. Uh, some people think they don't do very much, but actually in some tasks, the ice storm efficiency cores can actually perform at up to 50% of the level of the firestorm performance cores. And the M1 has four of these efficiency cores, so these are impacting the benchmark score that you see. Now, because of the different balance of the core types between these two types of chips, we can expect that in real world use, the margin of difference between M1 Pro and Max and the standard M1 is going to vary based on the actual work that's being done. And the same is true of the difference in architecture between M1 and x86. Some of the Intel and AMD chips that are scoring lower in Geekbench 5 will actually outperform M1 in some real world tasks. So whilst having these benchmarks is great, we do need to do some more testing once we've got hold of the machines. All of that said, these scores do indicate an incredible level of performance, pretty much unseen in portable computers before, and it's being achieved whilst using significantly less power than the PC competition. Uh, if standard M1 was the starter, M1 Pro and M1 Max look like they are the main course. 
This is what Apple has been working towards. And if the leaked schematics are to be believed, there are Mac Pro chips coming that are going to offer two and even four of these M1 Max chips all on one die. And that is phenomenal. For me though, these new chips are all about the GPU. As brilliant as the M1's graphics performance is for a low power integrated GPU, it's never been enough for the heavyweight creative workflows that need that graphics horsepower. But now we've got GPU options with 14, 16, 24 and 32 cores. And unlike CPU scaling, adding GPU cores is more linear. So it's easy to see why this is a brilliant thing. And all that extra memory bandwidth is something that GPUs just love. Apple made some pretty bold claims at the event, suggesting even that the 32 core GPU would be almost at the level of a mobile RTX 3080. And the benchmark numbers that are actually surfacing seem to pour doubt on those claims. As you can see in this example, OpenCL comparison. Uh, but again, we need to understand a few things before we draw any conclusions. Firstly, OpenCL is a framework that is deprecated in macOS uh, since Mojave 10.14. The framework does still exist and it can be used, but it's not actively developed or supported. Apple's GPUs are designed and optimized for their Metal framework. So there really isn't a way to run a direct comparison between these new M chips and Nvidia's GPUs using something like Geekbench. That said, these figures do clearly show that there is a huge margin of difference in raw compute power between these GPUs. And that difference can be explained away by optimization or margins of error. Other things to consider though are that the M1 GPU has access to the entire system RAM. And that means that it's got way more available video RAM than the Nvidia discrete GPU. So there will be some tasks, tasks which are heavily video RAM dependent, where the M1 will be able to close that gap. And my guess is that Apple carefully selected the benchmarks they used, and I doubt Geekbench was one of them. Of course, we need to wait and see what the real world testing shows up, but I think it's probably unlikely that the M1 GPUs will be taking on Nvidia's 3080 mobile chips for gaming performance. Uh, but that said, I'd be very happy to be wrong about that. Uh, what can we reasonably expect though? The 16 core GPU should be in the same ballpark as the top spec 5600M GPU that was previously available in the Intel 16 inch MacBook Pro. And that is a fantastic level of performance for a small laptop, and certainly good enough for some 1080p gaming. Now, no doubt there'll be Windows fans citing all of the gaming notebooks that are available with much better GPUs, and yes, of course there are. But the benefit of M1 is that low power draw. You'll get the same performance on battery as you do when you're plugged in, and you probably aren't gonna have the fans spinning up like crazy as well. The 32 core GPU, well that should be comfortably capable of playing the latest games. And in applications like video editing, where video RAM is important, these GPUs are going to set a new standard for mobile computing, especially considering those new media encoders, two of them in the M1 Max with their ProRes optimizations. So for the channel, we've got an entry level M1 Pro model coming on launch day. Uh, as soon as I get that, I'll post my initial thoughts and any of the initial tests that I do. Uh, but we've also ordered two M1 Max machines, one with the 24 core GPU and 32 gigs of RAM, and one with the 32 core GPU and 64 gigs of RAM. So let me know what you wanna see from those beasts of machines in the comments section. Uh, and please consider supporting the channel by subscribing and hitting the bell so that you can be notified when we release new content. Please consider sharing this video with someone who you think will enjoy it. And thanks in advance for your thumbs up or thumbs down. I'll see you soon for some more geekery.